So, undeniably, the thing that people ask the most about in the comments section were sequences. Lots of people wanted to see me talk about sequences. A lot of people wanted me to talk about arithmetic sequence and geometric sequences and sequences de defined explicitly, ones defined recursively, and things like that. So before we jump in and start doing the absolute first problem, congratulations at Kits at Tennis. Sorry. Um, but, but before we start even doing that, let's, let's just talk a little bit about sequences first. Okay, let's try to demystify it. Look, what a sequence is, is simply a bunch of numbers in a particular order. So I could have something like this. I could have 5, negative 10, 20, negative 40, 80, etc. Right? That's a sequence. That's all it is. It's a list of numbers. All right? But what's important about a sequence is sort of what number sits in what place and line. So in other words, this is the first number, this is the second number, the third number, the fourth number. And this is where things start to get a little confusing for students, especially when we have what are, what's called subscript notation, right? So in other words, if this sequence was called sequence A, let's say, then A1 would be 5, and A2 would be negative 10 and A3 would be 20, etc. This number down here, which is called the index of the sequence, I don't think you have to worry about that term, but this number down here just tells you where your place in line is. Now, to make things even more confusing with sequences, sometimes instead of using subscripts to tell you where your place in line is, sometimes we use function notation instead. So in other words, we could just as easily call this A1, A2, A3, etc. So if you see this function notation, right, hopefully you're familiar with that, then the number inside of the parentheses here also tells you where you are in line. That's it. Are you the number one position in line, the number two position in line, the number three position, etc. All right. So now, let's start jumping into some problems. Okay, so the first problem I'd like to do comes from the June 2015 exam. And what I'm going to do as I work on these problems is I'll tell you what exam it came from. So if you have, somehow have all the old regions exams in front of you, that's great, because then you don't have to look at your tiny screen. You can actually look at the problem in the regions exam. Whenever possible, I'll try to give credit to the person who asked the question, but keep in mind, and again, I apologize for this, there were lots of people that asked about sequences. I mean, a lot of people asked about sequences. And if I had listed every single person, that would be tough, all right? Sometimes you might see your, your own you know, Twitter handle, username, whatever, I'm old, I don't know the proper term, not the point. Um, the point is, you know, you might see your name on one of these things and go, I didn't ask for that region's question. And it could just be that you asked a particular thing. Could you explain the vertex form of a parabola? So I found a vertex form of a parabola region's question, put it on here, and then gave you credit for it. Whatever. Again, I do want to thank everybody that submitted questions. I spent like four or five hours this morning uh, just kind of looking through them and trying to figure out how this was all going to work. Anyway, let's take a look at this. This is one of the favorite things that regents love to do on the exam. They love to put like kind of some kind of geometric pattern, okay? So here we've got this pattern of blocks. Here's term one, term two, term three, term four, right? The question then says, if the pattern of blocks continues, which formulas, could be more than one, could be used to determine the number of blocks in the nth term, all right? So, What's kind of nice about this problem is it actually illustrates two different ways that we do sequences or give sequences. One of them is what's called with an explicit formula. It's like literally, all right, how do I figure out where I am at the nth term? Well, here's a formula that involves n. You plug the value of n in, and it tells you how many squares are in the pattern. The other one is what's called a recursive definition of a sequence. Recursive definitions of sequences occur when you base your next term on previous terms. And we'll see that a few different ways. But the first thing I really want to do in a situation like this, hey look, somebody's online. It happens to be my wife. I don't know how that's possible because she's not even here. Um, anyway, go away Skype. There, there it went. 
that, that kind of stuff's gonna happen every once in a while. All right, here we go. So the first thing I wanna do in a situation like this is really lay out what the pattern is. So A1 was two, right, you can count. A2 was equal to six. A3 is equal to 10. And let me just get rid of this stuff. We don't need it now. And A4 is equal to 14, right? Yep, that's it. And of course, one thing that we might notice right away is that to go from one term to the next term, we keep adding four. This is what's known as an arithmetic, an arithmetic sequence that has a constant difference. And a constant difference means if I take this and I subtract this, I get 4. If I take this and I subtract this, I get 4. If I take this and subtract this, I get 4. Right? It's the number I have to add on to get to the next, the next like, pattern or the next sorry, term in my sequence. All right. So let's see. Well, does this explicit formula in number 1 work? Well, for goodness sakes, test it. And you know what's great about it is this one says, to calculate the nth term of my sequence, I'm going to take the n, so that's where I am in line, n is where I am in line, and I'm going to add 4 to it. Well, let's just test it. So is a1 1 plus 4? Were there 5 squares in the first term? And the answer is no, there were only 2. Right? Now, they're trying to get you on this one because they're trying to make you say, well, I add 4 each time, so uh, there it is, plus 4. Mm, no. I mean, it's definitely, definitely, definitely not right because it doesn't work for this term. It does, by the way, work for this term. So if I take 2 and I plug it in, right, 2 plus 4 is 6, and that's the right number of squares, but it's got to work for all of them, and it doesn't here. So this one's gone, and of course, what's great about that is it then means this choice is out, and this choice is out. We're now down to a 50-50 shot if we were just guessing, but we're not going to guess, right? Let's take a look at number two. Number two, this choice, is what's called a recursive definition. Anytime you have a recursive definition, you always have to say what the first term is. It says a1 is two. Well, yep, a1 is two. And then how do we interpret this thing? a n equals a n minus 1 plus 4. Now, this is where students struggle. Remember, n tells you what place you are in line. So literally, this formula should be interpreted by saying, if I want to know what term sits in the nth position in line, I take the one that's 1 previous in the line and add 4 to it. That's all that n minus 1 is telling you. It's just saying, hey, go to the previous one and then add 4. And that is exactly what we're doing here, right? To calculate a2, we take a1 and we add 4. To calculate a3, we take a2 and add 4, etc. So this one definitely works. That's a good one. And then how about this formula? Well, again, it's about testing it. We could take out our calculator, but, I mean, really quick, let's just take a look. Well, let's see, a1. It says take, do 4 times the place we are in line minus 2. Well, that's 4 times 1 minus 2. That's 4 minus 2, and that's 2. Okay, that's right. That was right. All right, a2. Well, what is that 4 times 2 minus 2? Well, that's 8 minus 2, and that's 6. That one was right as well. Let's try a3. That's 4 times 3 minus 2. That's 12 minus 2, and that's 10. I forgot already. But, yeah, that's right. And finally, whoops, a 4. 4 times 4 minus 2, 16 minus 2, 14, and that's also right. So that formula also works. And we could actually go back and look at a formula that's on the Common Core out the common core formula sheet that you get with every exam, and we could actually work out why this formula is correct. The plain fact is, if they're giving you a formula and saying, does it work for these terms, and it does work for all those terms, then it's correct. So, choice two and choice three. And I suppose as soon as we knew choice two was right, then choice three was the only one that could have worked because two's not down here as well. That's just smart test taking. 
It's not math, it's just a process of elimination. All right? Let's do one more sequence problem before we move on. Now I got, I have a fair number of problems on each one of these things, all right? But for right now, let's take a look at 2014, June 2014 by Atran Nelson 03. Sorry if I'm again pronouncing these wrong. But let's take a look at what it says. It says a sunflower is three inches tall at week zero and grows two inches each week. All right. So three inches tall at week zero and grows two inches each week. Which functions shown below can be used to determine the height, f of n, of the sunflower in weeks? Now again, this is a very, very similar problem to what we had before, except now what's happening is we've got function notation instead of, um, in, instead of sort of the subscript notation that we had before, okay? But it still is very, very similar. Now before we kind of uh, start analyzing all these formulas, just think for a minute. It says the sunflower is three inches tall at week zero. So in other words, if n is the number of weeks, then we know that f of zero is three. And then it grows two inches each week. That means that f1 would be five, f2 would be eight, f3, whoops, nope, <laughs> f would be seven, nine, etc. And one could actually dispute whether or not this is a sequence problem or just a linear function problem. They're very, very similar, all right? But what we can do, again, is we can test them. Does this formula work? Well, if I put zero into this formula, I get two times zero, which is zero, plus three, three. All right, good. And then I can start playing around with this as well. Um, so let, let, let's just keep seeing if this one's right. If I put one in here, two times one is two, plus three is five. 2 times 2 is 4, plus 3 is 7. 2 times 3 is 6, plus 3 is 9. This one's definitely working. And this one is a straight up sort of linear function, right? Our y-intercept is 3, and we're going up by 2 inches each week. So it kind of makes sense. Now the question is, does this one work? 2n plus 3 times n minus 1. One thing you could do, by the way, here is you could simplify it if you wanted to. You could distribute the 3 through and you could like make it a little bit easier to use. But let's, let's just play around with this one. This is a much more difficult sort of formula to go through. Um, hey, whoa, hey, it turned red. Um, let's <laughs> head back to blue, I love it. All right, let's take a look at f of zero one here. And again, you've got your calculators. But let's kind of take a look at this, right? Just f of zero. Remember, I've got to get three out of this thing. And yet, 2 times 0, right? 2 times n, plus 3 times n minus 1, well, 2 times 0 is 0. 0 minus 1 is negative 1. 3 times negative 1 is negative 3. This thing predicts that I'm going to start at 0 weeks with a height oops, of negative 3. De definitely not, right? So right away, I know this one's out, all right? Which means this is out, this is out. And now the question is between these two. Now, this one is very similar to the last problem because I already know number one is correct. So that one would have to be out, and so therefore it would have to be four. But just for a minute, take a look at this one, right? Again, this gets back into the idea of defining something recursively. And what this one says is to figure out the height at any at n weeks, we would take the height at n minus one weeks, and we would add two to it. And that's exactly what's going on also with this thrown in, f of zero is three, right? So again, it's the way that we read these kind of sequences. Now I will say, a lot of people asked about geometric sequences. Can you, can you go through a geometric sequence? There is no question that geometric sequences are part of Common Core Algebra 1. They are in the standards. And yet I combed through the exams, and I could have missed it, I didn't see any on the New York State Regents exams. Geometric sequences, arithmetic sequences, which was what both of these problems were, you're simply adding or subtracting the same amount to get to the next sequence. That's what you're doing. So you're adding three each time to get to the next, I'm sorry, you're adding two each time. And here, and on this one, we were adding four each time to get to the next one. With geometric sequences, what you're doing is you're either multiplying or dividing by the same amount each time to get to the next term. 
That's all you're doing. So for instance, all the way back up here, this is actually a geometric sequence because each time what I'm doing is I'm multiplying by negative 2. And if that sounds a lot like an exponential function, well, then you're right. Exponential functions and geometric sequences behave very similarly. Linear functions and arithmetic sequences behave very similarly. All right. If we can, we'll come back to more sequence problems, but I'd like to move on and take a look at rate of change, all right? also known as average rate of change. Okay, so this is a topic that a few people asked about, but it shows up on the exam a lot. How fast is a function changing compared to how fast its inputs are changing? And there's a, there's a formula for this. It's literally like if x is going from a to b, then the average rate of change is f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a. All right, this is exactly the same formula that you use to calculate the slope of a line, okay? And in fact, the first problem, which I kind of picked, even though nobody had asked about this particular problem, really gets at that. It's very nice. It says, which function has a constant rate of change equal to negative 3? A constant rate of change equal to negative 3. The only types of functions that have constant rates of change are linear functions. Functions that, when graphed, look like lines. All right, so let's take a look at this and try to figure out which one of these things. This comes from one of the exams. I didn't note it. I don't know why. Um, but basically, what I'm looking for is I'm looking for something that, when x increases by 1, y decreases by negative 3, or decreases by 3. If you're decreasing by negative 3, you're increasing. Anyway, not the point. Take a look at this particular function given in this table. Now notice, x is increasing by 1, 0, 1, 2, 3. y is increasing by 3, right? Now what that means is that its constant rate of change is a positive 3. Its change in y divided by change in x is positive 3, not negative 3, okay? Um, let's take a look at this one, right? The, the graph of this line. Now remember, for a line, the average rate of change or the rate of change is equal to its slope. Well, what is the slope of this line? Well, this line for one unit to the right is two units down. So the delta y over delta x in this particular graph, a, is negative 2 divided by 1, or negative 2. But I'm looking for something that has a slope of negative 3. Let's take a look at this one, choice 2. Well, again, it's kind of tricky. But here's a function that's just given as a set of ordered pairs. That's it. Now, let's take a look as we go from here to here. Right Now, again, notice I have x is 1, and then x is 2. What's great about that is that my change in x is just one unit. So I really only have to look at my change in y. And when I go from 5 to 2, that's a change of negative 3. Okay? So between these two points, delta y divided by delta x is negative 3 divided by 1, or negative 3. The problem is, that's where it falls apart. Because now, as I go from 2 to 3, again, just a change in one unit, the y's go from 2 to negative 5, and that's a change in y of negative 7 units, right? To go from 2 all the way down to negative 5, I mean, you can do the subtraction. You can do negative 5 minus 2 and get negative 7. But just think about it. If you're on the y-axis and you go from positive 2 down to negative 5, you've decreased by negative 7, x has increased by 1, that means that you've got an average rate of change of negative 7 between those two. So that one's not right either. In fact, at the end of the day, it's this one. All right? I mean, we, we've gone through all three of them. It ends up being this one. Now, why does it end up being this one? Well, real quick, let's take a look. This, hopefully, you would recognize is the equation of a line. Right? It's not the equation of a parabola, because it doesn't have an x squared in it. It's not the equation of an exponential function, because it doesn't have an exponent in it, All right, uh, as well as various other reasons. We'll talk more about exponential functions in just a bit. 
but it's the equation of the line. Both y and x are to the first power. The thing is, it's not written in y equals mx plus b form. In fact, if you take this thing, 2y equals negative 6x plus 10, and you divide both sides by 2, and remember, just like multiplication, division distributes. So I have to do negative 6 divided by 2, and that would give me negative 3x, and then 10 divided by 2, and that would give me positive 5. Right here we have a line, a linear function, whose slope is negative 3 and whose y-intercept is 5. I actually don't care at all the fact that its y-intercept is 5. I wanted to find one of these functions that had a constant rate of change of negative 3, and there it is. Because this is a line, its rate of change, which is constant, is its slope, and that's equal to negative 3. So there's my winner. Whew, that took a little while because I had to work through all the other ones. Let's take a look at one that somebody actually kind of asked about. All right, so August 2014, at Matt, Ty, Tig, sorry. Um, and again, I don't remember if Matt asked this question specifically or if he just asked me to do some kind of average rate of change problem. Let's take a look at this one. 14, the table below shows the average diameter of a pupil in a person's eye as he or she grows older. What is the average rate of change in millimeters per year of the, person, of the person's pupil diameter from age 20 to age 80? So we're really looking for a rate here. How fast is that diameter changing as the person goes from year 20 to year 80? Well, literally, what we're doing in this case, right, again, that rate of change formula, f of b minus f of a divided by b minus a, right, so I really want right, the pupil diameter at 80, which is 2.3, minus the pupil diameter at 20, which is 4.7, divided by 80 minus 20. All right. And obviously, that takes a little bit of work on the calculator. Let me just grab mine. I'm not going to fire up the, the uh, computer one at this point. We'll use that when we need to. All right, so that's negative 2.4 divided by 60, and that's negative 0 0.04. Easy enough. Choice four. Now, there's something important about this one, okay? And what's important about this is that rate of change tells us not only how fast something is changing, but whether it's increasing or decreasing. Clearly, as a person is getting older, their average pupil diameter is decreasing. It's going down. So that rate of change has to be negative. And I'm sure that there's plenty of us, you know, adults, kids, everybody, that still feel a little uncomfortable when you subtract a larger number from a smaller number. And therefore, even if you knew how to do this problem, you might say to yourself, well, I'm going to do 4.7 minus 2.3 and then divide by 60, and you'd get choice two, all right? Which is very problematic because again, number one, it's the wrong answer. But number two, if you have an average rate of change or a rate of change that's positive, either this one or this one, then, that, then the output should be getting larger as the input gets larger. And in this case, the output is going down that average rate of change has to be negative, okay? Very, very important. All right, let's move on from this, though. We got another one on here. We'll come back to it if we can. I want to be watching my time. I don't have a clock anywhere. That's amazing. Um, what time is it, Joey? 3.30. 3.30. All right, just, just watching our time. Uh, you know. Anyway, it, it's funny. I've got a monitor, a monitor, a monitor, uh, all sorts of things. I don't have a clock anywhere. <laughs> uh, but that's okay. It's fine. We'll do, we'll do a spot time check every once in a while. All right. So linear equations and expressions. Um, lots of people were just like, can you show me how to solve an equation? And it's like, that's broad. That's very broad. <laughs> and there's, of course, a lot of equation solving on this exam. All right. So let's take a look at one. August 2016 um, by at Nate Has. Has. I'm just going to say Nate. Anyway, Nate, thanks for this question. This is one of the harder ones to solve, but he asked about this one specifically. August 2016, number 32. He asked, um, it says, solve the equation below 
4x in terms of a. And this is something that a lot of people struggle with. Um, when you've got an equation that has more than one, let me put it this way, more than one letter in it, right? This equation has both an a and an x in it. We want to make sure we're solving for the thing they're asking us to solve for. We're going to solve 4x, okay? So that means eventually one side of my equation has an x on it and the other side doesn't, okay? So let's just start solving this thing. And again, how should you start solving it? Well, do whatever you have to do. Do you know what I mean? You know, try things that you know. So for instance, one thing I know I can do is I know I can distribute this 4, right? And when I get that, I get 4ax plus 12 minus 3ax equals 25 plus 3a. We're solving for x. Never lose sight of where you're trying to get, or it's probably likely that you won't get there, right? I'm solving for x. So, generally speaking, anything that has an x in it, I want to get on one side of the equation, and anything without an x, I want to move to the other side. So right now I've got this term has an x in it, this term has an x in it, but I have this 12 sitting here, and I don't need it there. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to subtract that 12 from both sides. It's called the addition property of equality, or the what you do to one side, you do to the other side property. All right, so I'm going to just subtract 12 from both sides. That's going to leave me with 4ax minus 3ax. And what do I have? I have 25 minus 12. That's easy enough. That's 13 plus 3a. All right. Now what? Well, this is kind of weird. Obviously, if I had 4x minus 3x, I think probably everyone would be comfortable to just say, well, that's, that's 1x. Or if I had 5x minus 2x, everyone would say that's 3x. But what do we do in this case, right? Well, some of you might be able to very quickly say that's 1ax, okay? But the sort of trick, if you will, is to bring some factoring in. I know we haven't reviewed that, but x is a common factor of both of these terms. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to factor it out like this. Right, I've got that. It's all looking good. Now, there's actually nothing in this problem that says I've absolutely got to simplify this. You know? But hopefully everyone will feel comfortable with the fact that 4a minus 3a is just a single a. Right? In which case, what I have now is I've got a times x on the left side equals 13 plus 3a on the right side. Right? So that 4a minus 3a became an a. And that 13 plus 3a hasn't been doing much since maybe like line 1. And of course, now to get rid of the a that's multiplying x, I just have to divide by a on both sides. All right, those a's cancel. And I'm going to leave my answer that way. All right, could you distribute the division by a? Sure you could. Do you need to? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. This is a completely acceptable way to leave your answer. I wouldn't change it at all. Just leave it as 13 plus 3a divided by a. Okay? Let's keep going. Let's do another one of these. Okay. So, January 2015, Alex Mosher asks for this question, I think. Either that or he just asked me to do like an equation solving question from then here. But here we go. Let's take a look. Um, a gardener is planting two types of trees. Lots of people, by the way, asked for me to do problems where I changed a word problem into something like an equation and then solved the equation. And this one certainly fits that bill. So here we go. We have a gardener planting two types of trees. Type A is three feet tall and grows at a rate of 15 inches per year. Type B is four feet tall and grows at a rate of 10 inches per year. We need to algebraically determine how many years it will take for these trees to be the same height. All right. So the first thing that you want to do is just, just make sure that you have a feeling for what's going on, right? Like if I asked you how tall is type A, the type A tree, after let's say two years, what would you do? Well, you'd say, well, let's see, it's growing 15 inches per year, so I'd do 15 times two, and I'd say, oh, I got 30 inches, and then I'd add that 30 inches to those three feet. But of course, it's mixed units, right? So ultimately, if you really wanted to figure out how tall type A was after two years, 
It's not what the question's asking, but if you were trying to figure that out, you'd have to convert those three feet into inches. That's easy enough, right? Three feet times 12, 36 inches. So you'd take the 36 inches, you'd add it to the 30 inches, and whatever, you'd have 66 inches. Right? You could do the same thing for type B. Now what I want to be able to do from that is I want to be able to change it into some kind of an equation. So let's, let's do a little, little let statement, right? Let me let x be the number of years, right? So if x is the number of years, let's write an equation for how tall type A is in x years, all right? And then, and let's make sure that we do it in terms of inches. Because again, we, we've got to do it that way. We can't add feet to inches, inches to feet, even though I might be six feet, two inches tall. Ultimately, to do anything with that kind of height, I would have to change it all to inches or all to feet, but then that would get awfully ugly. We, we, we don't want to go with that. So anyway, let x be equal to the number of years. For type A then, what we would have is we would start with those 36 inches, right, three feet tall, and it's growing at a rate of 15 inches per year. So that's how tall in inches type A is going to be. Now type B starts at 4 feet tall. Okay, All in terms of inches, 4 times 12 is 48. So it starts at 48 inches, right? And it grows at a rate of 10 inches per year. And of course, I set these two equal because ultimately I'm algebraically trying to determine exactly how many years it will take for the trees to be the same height. So I set the height of type A equal to the height of type B, and now I solve. And this is going to be a much easier one to solve than before. There's no A's floating around or anything like that. Let's get all the X's on one side, all the things without X on the other side. Again, we're going to just use properties of equality. For instance, you know, I think I'm going to move all the X's to this side, so I'll subtract 10X from both sides. Right? When I do that, what I'll have here is I'll have 36 plus 5x is equal to 48. Is that right? Yeah, looks good. Um, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to get rid of the 36 from both sides. So I'm going to subtract 36. All right, and that's going to give me 5x is equal to 12. All right, and finally, I'm going to divide by 5 on both sides. And I'm going to get x equals 12 fifths. And there's my, my magic red. Now, for me, at least, I'd like that in terms of a decimal. All right, easy enough to do 12 divided by 5. And I find exactly 2.4 years. Exactly 2.4 years for those two plants to be the same height. Yeah, let me just make sure. Yep. I was a little bit surprised that it didn't come out to be an integer, but there's no reason that it has to be an integer. At least it's not like a really, really messy answer. All right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to move on. Sorry, abnormal girl, one, two, three. I love some of these names. Um, let's talk about transformations. Okay. Transformations, and Joey, can you give me like a five when you think it's like five minutes till four? Yeah. We're not there, really. Okay. Anyway. Um, so transformations, right? they're a big, big part of this course, okay? And there's basically three things you have to worry about. You have to worry about a graph being moved vertically, being moved horizontally, and then being stretched vertically, all right? Um, or compressed vertically. Technically speaking, you're also supposed to be worried about being stretched horizontally. I haven't really seen that on any Regents exams, and it's, it's considerably trickier. Okay, so basically, this is the way it goes. To get a vertical shift up or down, right, you're going to take a function and you're going to add to go up and you're going to subtract to go down from the overall function. Okay, and that should just make sense. All right, if I've got some function and I add 5 to the function, and remember the function is the y value. Anytime you see f of x, I want you to say, oh, that's the y value. That's what it is. f of x is the y value. It's the output of the function. So if I take all the y values and I add 5 to them, my function goes up by 5. 
If I take all the y values and I subtract 3 from them, my function goes down by 3. That should make all the sense in the world. What's quite confusing is when you do horizontal shifting. Because horizontal shifting occurs when you first do something to the input variable before anything else. So if I'm subtracting from the input variable before I do anything else, it actually moves it to the right, which is very counterintuitive. You'd think that would move to the left, but it doesn't. And likewise, if I were to add to the input variable first, it shifts it to the left. Okay. Now, the last little piece is the stretching issue. And I've I got to say, I've seen these two come up more than the stretching issue. But basically, the way the stretching issue works is if I take my function and I multiply it by a number, right? If that number is bigger than 1, if it's 2, 3, 1 and a half, 10, then the function gets stretched. And many times, it has the effect of making it look more narrow. All right, But ultimately, it's really stretching it because all the y values are getting multiplied by this number bigger than 1. If that number is negative, it also flips it. It flips. All the positive y's become negative. All the negative y's become positive. Okay. Finally, if that number is somewhere between 0 and 1, so it's like 0.5 or 0.75 or 0.1, then what's happening is the function is getting compressed all the y values are getting smaller. They're getting multiplied by this factor that's forcing them to be smaller. Now, some of these problems are actually quite, quite easy. Take a look at this one. June 2016, asked by at Terramatic, right? It looks really, really complicated. Here we go. In the diagram below, f of x, which is equal to x cubed plus 2x squared, is graphed. Also graphed is g of x. So here's f of x, right? That's that one. And then g of x is down here, the result of a translation. Okay, a translation is that shift. All right, it's a shift. It's just up, down, or left, right. Okay, it's the effect of a translation. And they want us to determine an equation for g of x and explain our reasoning. All right, so what happened? Right, we took f of x, and how did we get g of x? Well, the plain fact is, hopefully, by simply looking at this one point, right, and looking at this one point, what you can see is that the entire function simply got moved down four units. We took the function and we just shifted it down four units. And the way you do that with any function is by adding or subtracting to the overall formula and in the way that you would think. So in other words, g of x is just f of x minus 4, but that means that g of x is equal to x cubed plus 2x squared minus 4. All right? Now, this is the answer, but if all we do is write that down, we won't get full credit because it tells us that we must explain our reasoning. You don't have to do a lot here. You don't have to get into a paragraph or anything else. All you have to say is something like this. g of x is the graph of f of x after it has been shifted. Four units down. Now, if right now your most pressing question is, uh, why does my pen every once in a while turn red? That's probably not a good thing. You probably actually want your most pressing question to be, okay, I, I, I understood that. Can we go on to the horizontal stuff? I don't know why the pen every once in a while turns red. It's, it drives me nuts. Um, the red pen isn't even here, but it, it showed up and it disappeared. It's like a ghost red pen, I don't get it. Anyway, but that's it. That's all you have to do, right, to explain your reasoning. Where did that answer come from? Ah, it came from the fact that g of x is the graph of f of x after it has been shifted down four units. That's it. That's the whole deal. Now let's take a look at one, hopefully that's got a horizontal. Here we go. August 2016, at Nate Paz. All right. 
Number 26. Richard is asked to transform the graph of b of x below. All right, so we got some funky graph of b of x, okay? The graph of b of x is transformed using this equation. h of x equals b of x minus 2 minus 3. Describe how the graph of b of x changed to form the graph of h of x. All right, so this is important. And a lot of people ask me to do problems where there was something in here, you know, I mean, it was kind of unclear exactly what they wanted, but again, probably something like this. So there's two transformations that have occurred. First, because something has happened to that input variable before anything else, right, b of x minus 2, we subtracted 2 from the x before the function b even kind of got to do its thing, okay, that means that we move right two units. Okay, and then because we have a minus 3 to the overall function, that means we've moved down 3 units. Now, that's not enough. They actually say describe how the graph has been changed. So all we have to do is say b of x has been, and if you want to use the word move, that's okay. All right, um, shift, translate, move. Whatever, let me use move. B of x has been moved two units right. And three units down. It's all about, it's all about whether or not it's happening to the input variable x before anything else or it's happening sort of at the end of the function, to the overall function. If it's happening to the variable itself, then it's a horizontal shift, right, left, and it kind of works counterintuitive. Subtraction means you're moving to the right. Addition means you're moving to the left. On the other hand, if it's happening to the overall variable, then it's moving up and down, all right? And we're gonna look more at this when we get into what's known as the vertex form of a parabola. But just for a moment, let me, let me break out of this. I'm going to go into Chrome and into a program called Desmos. So really quick, all right? Let me just graph something really fast. Y equals x squared. All right. We all know our friend y equals x squared, right? What happens, though? Let's just kind of illustrate this. Let's do x minus 3 squared. Right, take a look at that. y equals x minus 3 squared is this parabola, and what's happened is it's moved to the right three units. Right? We subtract 3 from the x before we do anything else, and it moves to the right three units, it being y equals x squared. On the other hand, if I had something like this, y equals x squared minus 3, Right, get rid of this. Right now, what's happened is our red parabola has been moved vertically down three units because that subtraction by three is happening to the overall function y equals x squared. Okay, so just to give you kind of a real example of what's going on there. All right, now we're on transformations. Let's take a look at what we have next. U full screen. Completing the square. There were so many people who, that was it. It was just like, can you complete the square? Can you complete the square? Can you complete the square? And a lot of people actually wanted me to do completing the square when what's called the leading coefficient, the number in front of x squared, isn't 1. And I have to tell you, it doesn't come up a lot. It really doesn't. So if you're very comfortable completing the square where the leading coefficient, the number that's multiplying x squared is 1, then you're probably pretty good. I tried to find somewhere that wasn't the case. But anyway, let's jump into completing the square and review how that process is even done. So June 2014, at Lauren M, um, asked about completing the square. I can't get this to move. All right, so here we go. You know, it says, which equation has the same solutions as this one? We're not even solving the equation. We're just saying which one has the same solutions. Well, let's take a look. One of the things you use completing the square for is solving quadratic equations, equations where there's an x squared in them. Now, if I'm solving this equation, all right, using completing the square, completing the 
squared has absolutely nothing to do with that number, that minus 12. It's all about the x squared and the 6x. So what I would do is I would put that 12 on the other side. I'd add 12 to both sides. Right? And I'd get something like this. x squared minus 6x equals 12. Now, the process of completing the square is what's known as an algorithm in math. Okay, and it's called an algorithm because it's just a step one, step two, step three kind of procedure. That's what it is. So, how do you complete the square? Assuming that the number multiplying x is 1, okay, and it is, it's not written, but it is 1, then what we do is we look at the coefficient that's multiplying the x to the first, right, again, that 1 to the first is not written, and we divide it by 2. So we take that, that negative 6 and we divide by 2, and we get negative 3, okay? And then we take that negative 3 and we square it. And that's, of course, positive 9. And then we add that to this binomial. So we get x squared minus 6x plus 9. But here's the problem, right? And here's the thing. An equation is like a scale. And if you add a number to one side and you don't add it to the other, that scale gets out of balance unless the number you add is 0. You can add a whole lot of nothing to either side of the equation as much as you want. You don't have to add it to the other side. But in this case, I've added 9 to this side of the equation. I've got to add 9 to this side of the equation like this. All right? Now, what's the point? Well, when you do completing the square, the idea now is that this is what's known as a perfect square trinomial. If I factored it into a binomial times a binomial, those two binomials would be the same. And in fact, this would factor as x minus 3 times x minus 3. I want you to think about that a little bit, right? And then, you know, however you think about multiplying binomials, whether it's foiling or whatever, x times x is x squared minus 3x minus 3x is minus 6x. Negative 3 times negative 3 is positive 9. Now, by the way, I bet your teachers pointed this out to you. If you're ever kind of confused about, well, how does this thing factor, right? It's all about this, all right? That half of B, that half of B is what's going to be in here and here. And in fact, at the end of the day, let's finish this problem. That's x minus 3 squared equals 21. I don't need to go any farther than that, okay? Because they're just saying which one of these equations has the same solutions as that one, and there it is x minus 3 squared equals 21. We'll come back later on and we'll look at how to solve something like that, but we're not there yet. It's 5 to 4. I'm sorry, it's 5 to 4? Okay, so we're going to do a little bit more and then we're going to go over to comments um, just for a little bit, and then we're going to come back because, boy, the first hour's already flown. Um, let's take a look really quickly at number 16, though. A lot of people asked about the vertex form of a parabola, okay? And this is another place where completing the square is exceptionally helpful. So let's take a look at this. At Jack Constantino, June 2016, number 16, which equation and ordered pair represent the correct vertex form and vertex for this parabola? All right. So this is a little bit different. Um, let me just rewrite it right here. x squared minus 12x plus 7. All right. This time, I'm going to leave that 7 hanging out right there. OK? And what I'm going to do is I'm going to take half of that negative 12, right? I'm going to do negative 12 divided by 2 and get negative 6. All right. I'm going to square it and get 36. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add 36 on. Now, in the last problem, I then added 36 to the other side. I could do that, and if your teacher told you to do that always, then do it always. In a situation like this, for me, what I do is I just add a whole lot of nothing. I add 36 and I subtract 36 at the same time, and then I'm very careful not to lose that 7. Okay, basically by adding 36 and subtracting 36, what we've done is we've added 0. We've done nothing, right? It's like multiplying by 1, adding 0. So, what I'm now going to do is I'm now going to group those three together. That's what's known as the associative property of addition, if you like to know. So I'm going to just add and group all those three together. And these three now should be a perfect square trinomial. Specifically, they are x minus 6 squared. These 
two then, right, I can combine to be negative 29. So what is that? Do I have that? All right. Well, that's either this choice or this choice, right? Those two are my, my two choices that match up with this. The question is, what's the vertex of this parabola? That's the vertex form of a parabola. Well, here's the key, all right? It's all about what we just did, transformations. You see, the basic parabola, y equals x squared, has a vertex at 0, 0, right? That's where y equals x squared has a vertex. This parabola, on the other hand, is this one after a shift to the right 6 units and down 29 units, right? Because we're subtracting 6 from x, we go to the right 6, and because we're subtracting 29 overall, we go down 29. So that means that the point 0, 0 then ends up being the point 6, comma, negative 29. And it's this. On the other hand, if you want, you know, and you're really concerned about the vertex form of the parabola, you could say, all right, I'm going to look inside of the thing that's squared. I'm going to sort of do the opposite. So because that's minus 6, it's positive 6 here. And then this just is that negative 29. But it's really helpful to understand it from a transformation perspective. We're always starting with that really simple parabola, y equals x squared, vertex at 0, 0, right there at the origin. And then it's how did it get shifted? How did the vertex get shifted? Because obviously, if I'm shifting the overall parabola, I'm shifting the vertex as well. And I shifted it so that it then became 6, comma, negative 29. All right, we're going to pause for a moment. We're going to turn the camera back so that it's vertical. And hopefully, nobody's going to get a headache on that. We'll turn comments back on. Um, have a little color commentary by you guys as I basically just monologue, you know, just kind of talk. Talk into whatever. All right, all right. We got we got the comments back out. Uh, yeah, I'm having a crisis. I'm sorry about that. I think those are old. Oh, these are old. Okay, maybe those are old comments. I I don't know. Um, but what, are the comments not on yet? They're on. Oh, they are. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I don't know. Uh -huh. Who knows? Um, can you do please do sequences? Please. Okay. Um, by the way, I see somebody asking about discriminants. All right. The discriminant of a quadratic which is the b squared minus 4ac portion of the quadratic formula, it doesn't really tend to be something in Common Core Algebra 1. The only thing that I've ever seen the discriminant used for, and again, that's the portion underneath the square root, underneath the square root of the quadratic formula, the b squared minus 4ac, is if that thing is negative, right? And everyone should know you can't take the square root of a negative number at least in Algebra 1. In Algebra 2, confusingly enough, we're going we're gonna to teach you how to take the square root of a negative number. But for right now, right, what you should know, any, if anything about the discriminant, is if the discriminant is negative, then the parabola will not touch the x-axis. It won't have any zeros. We haven't really talked a lot about zeros yet, but we're going to get back into them in a little bit. Um, all right, shout out to... Um, and I've always been confused about this. Hamox Middle School, um, you know, I, you know, I, I love you guys. Um, I, I just don't know how to pronounce the name of your school, um, which is terrible. But you know, quadratic formulas? Question mark. Um, we'll get back to the quadratic formula. Um, although it's interesting, not that many people. Uh oh, the live video has ended. Ah, that's weird. I say we go live again. Okay. I think there might be a time limit. There might be a time limit. Okay. Let's oh do that. my god. Start live video. It, it's probably exactly one hour. I'll be darned. Okay, Kirk Weiler started a live video. Um, okay, well now we know. Yes. We learned something there. Oh my god. <laughs> Well, so we, we just learned something. Um, it appears, although we could be wrong, that um, live videos can be at most one hour in length. Um, I'm not sure if that's the case. Uh, I'm definitely going to go, yeah, what happened? Good question. Um, so what, what, what we think happened, what we think happened, thank you for joining us again, um, although we never, then we didn't get the stats on the last live video, you know what I mean? It's oh, like, I didn't. We got it to a thousand, oh, over a thousand. Wow. Wow. 
don't know. Um, anyway, so what happened, I guess, is that live videos um, last at most an hour. And we did some research on Instagram live videos. Um, that was probably <laughs> buried somewhere in footnotes, but I missed it. <laughs> I didn't see it. Um, don't worry, we are going to be going over factoring. Um, yeah, residuals. No problem. Uh, Dante? Anyway, um, never forget, Kurt mentioned me. All right, yeah. Yeah, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna keep talking about homics. Okay, Marcellus High School. Shout out to Grand Avenue. All right. Anyway, boy, there's there's a lot of people from a certain school watching. Anyway, so yeah, we're we're gonna get into a lot more topics. For instance, just in case you're wondering, um, you know, we're gonna be uh, we'll kind of move on next eventually to exponential functions. Hopefully, we'll get into some factoring in zeros. Maybe one quadratic formula problem. Uh, quadratic equations, things like that. You don't have to turn it yet. Um, uh, systems of equations, there's lots of stuff that we've got left, and hopefully we'll get so many of them. Systems of inequalities, oh, so much on this exam, so little time. Statistics, that's where your residuals are going to come. Piecewise functions, lots of different things. Um, what were we just on? We we're on completing the squares, so eventually we're going to be going to exponential, although, oh, uh, oh yeah. Yeah, we might want to do one of these. I'll probably do this one eventually. Yeah. So, a lot left to do. Should we should we get back to it? Um, what do you guys think? Should we should we get back to the to the problem solving? Uh, waiting, 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 waiting. You know, I'm only two kids, daddies. But anyway, that's that's just, <laughs> it's just it's one of the weirdest compliments or statements. Anyway, no, seriously, I got two children. I'm definitely their daddy. Um, so anyway, we're going to go back to problem solving. We're going to do one more completing the square problem because I want to I want to look at one where the uh, coefficient is not equal to um, one and take a look at how to handle that. So we're going to rewrite the ship or put it back into some weird, uh, weird orientation and then we're going to turn comments off. Sorry about that. Uh, right. Yep. Um, and, uh, okay. Hi, comments. Sorry about that, guys. We will turn them on at the end. Again, at around 5 o'clock, we'll put them on. But we gotta, we gotta do some math here. Um, let, let's get back to this. So, view, full screen. Here we go. All right. So, last, um, last completing the square problem. Okay. So, here we go. January 2016 at Brandy Ritter. Um, Fred's teacher gave the class the quadratic function f of x equals 4x squared plus 16x plus 9. Letter A, state two different methods Fred could use to solve the equation f of x is equal to 0. Well, you know, this is a little bit annoying of a question in my mind because you've learned a lot, a lot of different ways of solving quadratics set equal to 0. You know, you've learned how to use the quadratic formula, you've learned how to use completing the square, you've learned how to use what's called the zero product law, also known as factoring to find the zeros, um, uh, inverse uh, operations, a lot of different things. This one can't be factored, all right? And by the way, I know it can't be factored because part B says using one of the methods stated in part A, solve f of x equals zero for x to the nearest tenth. If you can factor in a quadratic equation, you're not going to have to round the answers. They're going to come out to be nice numbers. All right. So anyway, the two methods that we could use, though, are completing the square. And the quadratic formula. All right. Again, for the sake of time, I'm not kind of writing all these things out as I should on the test. We only have so much time. Anyway. So now, part B says, okay, use one of these methods, solve f of x equal to zero to the nearest tenth. All right, so let's like kind of keep this up here. I'll go down here if I need to. I have x, f of x equals 4x squared plus 16x plus 9 equals zero. Now, I want you to keep in mind, I would most likely just solve this using the quadratic formula. I might even solve it graphically. In other words, put this into my calculator, graph it, and use the zero command. That could be one of the two methods. And it's absolutely fair game, okay? Don't forget you've got that calculator. But I wanna do this one using completing the square because that leading coefficient, that four, is not, you know, it's, it's, it's not one, okay? So let's do it by completing the square. Again, the nine is kind of irrelevant. I'm gonna move it to the other side. 
So 4x squared plus 16x equals negative 9. I hope everyone's comfortable with the fact that it's positive 9 here, it's negative 9 there. Now, how do I deal with the fact that that's a 4? Well, look, had that been a negative 8 or a negative 4 or a negative 12 or something that was nicely divisible by 4, I'd probably just divide both sides of this equation by 4. And you can still do that right now. Okay? You can totally, totally do that. But again, let's, let's pretend that we can't. What I'm going to do is I'm going to factor the 4 out of both of these two expressions. And I'm going to get x squared plus 4x. And I'll leave myself a little bit of space there. All right. And apparently I'm going to get a red 9 over there. Anyway, what's now inside of here is a quadratic. Forget about that 4. Is a quadratic where the leading coefficient is equal to 1. So now I can do that whole, well, I'll take this number and I'll divide it by 2 and I'll get 2, right? And then I'll take the 2 and I'll square it and I'll get 4. So I'm going to do plus 4 right there. But here's what's tricky. I can't do plus 4 here because I didn't really add 4 to the left-hand side. What I added was 4 times 4. I really added 16 to the left side. I didn't add 4, all right? So in fact, I have to add 16 to that side of the equation, all right? I'm going to just get rid of this, all right? I'm going to move this up a little bit. So now, this quadratic here factors as x plus 2, quantity squared. Of course, on this side, negative 9 plus 16 is just positive 7, okay? Now, if I want to solve for x, and again, this kind of gets into how do I solve a quadratic equation using completing the square? Well, notice, x only shows up once, just once. So think about what's been done to x. I added 2, then I squared, then I multiplied by 4, and I got 7. To undo that, what I'm going to do is I'm going to undo each one of those things in the opposite order. Added 2, squared, multiplied by 4, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide by 4 on both sides. That's going to give me x plus 2. Quantity squared is equal to 7 fourths. I think I'd just leave it that way. Just leave it as 7 fourths. I mean, if you wanted to, you could make that into 1.75. And you might want to, because maybe that will just be easier to deal with now that I think about it. Right? So 7 divided by 4, 1.75. Now, undoing the squaring. I have to take the square root of both sides. Don't forget, though, when you're solving a problem where something has been squared and you take the square root of both sides, that introduces a plus minus, okay? So now, I've got x plus 2 is equal to plus or minus the square root of 1.75. All right? Again, that's an ugly square root, the square root of 1.75. I'll deal with that later on my calculator. And now to get x all by itself, I'm just going to subtract 2 from both sides. And now it's an issue of calculating. Literally, I'm going to take my calculator, right? And I'm going to type in uh, square root of 1.75. And I'm going to subtract 2. I'm going to get negative point. Well, let's see, it says to the nearest tenth, that ends up being negative 0.7, and that's the positive version. And then I'm going to do negative square root of 1.75 minus 2, and I'm going to get negative 3.3. All right. Now again, if you're comfortable with the quadratic formula, if you like yourself some quadratic formula, then use the quadratic formula on this problem. Okay? I would probably not do it using completing the square. I only did it this time because there were tons and tons of people that wanted me to do a completing the square problem where that leading coefficient wasn't 1. Again, they really don't come up very often. So concentrate on what's important. Make sure you know how to complete the square when the leading coefficient is 1. Okay? Let's keep going. Exponential functions. Exponential functions are amazingly important on the Common Core Algebra 1 exam. An exponential function is one that basically looks like this. Some number times another number raised to the x. Okay? So for instance, y equals, that didn't work. Let's try that again. 
So, for instance, y equals 5 times 1.73 to the x. That's an exponential function. y equals uh, 2 times 0 0.83 raised to the x. That's an exponential function. Now, all exponential functions have what are called two parameters, two things that kind of dictate what they look like, the a and the b. Okay? The a is the y-intercept of the function, all right? Or it's your starting amount. Like if I have one of these problems where I put a certain amount of money into a savings account, how much I put in there to begin with, that's my A. The B is what's called your growth or your decay factor. It's how much you're multiplying each time unit by to get to the next one. That's that geometric sequence idea. Now, exponential functions will either be increasing functions, and that's if the b is greater than 1, or they will be decreasing or decaying functions. And that's if the b is less than 1, but greater than 0. The base of an exponential function is never negative. All right, there's a variety of reasons for that. We're not going to go into it right now. All you have to worry about is the idea that when the base is bigger than 1, the exponential function increases. When the base is less than 1, but greater than 0, then the exponential function decreases. Okay? So let's jump into an exponential function problem. August 2014, at Rory Stevens 17. Rhonda deposited $3,000 in an account in the Merrick National Bank. Long Island. Um, earning 4.2% interest compounded annually. She made no deposits or withdrawals, write an equation that can be used to find B, her balance, after T years. Okay? So B is her balance, T is the number of years. All right? Before you even go there, of course, you want to make sure that you can say, well, if I just wanted to know how much this person had next year, what would I do? Well, the difficult way, the long way about doing it is saying, well, I'll take my $3,000 and I'll multiply by, here's my percent, as a decimal point, 0.042. You know, I get some number, okay, whatever that is, that's how much more I would have, and then I'd add that to 3,000. Hopefully, you did enough exponential modeling problems to know, ooh, that was kind of cool, to know that what I would do is I just multiply by 1.042. It's 1 plus the rate, okay? Where the rate is the decimal version of the percent. So 4.2% is 0.042. And that can be a little tricky. It can even be a little tricky to see on your, your phones because they're small. 1.042. That's how much I'd have after one year. After two years, I would get to multiply by 1.042 again. Every year, I get to multiply what I had the previous year by 1.042. So after t years, what's happened is I've gotten to multiply the 3,000 by 1.042 t times. Now, you got to be careful. Because that's essentially the answer, but you'd probably lose a point because it's not an equation, and this thing says, write an equation. It's one of the things I dislike the most about the grading of things like Regents exams. It's not your teacher's fault. They would love to give you full credit for something like this. Well, maybe they would. Um, but the plain fact is the rubrics that they are given will say something like, well, if it's not an equation, you've got to take off a point. So, the balance. is 3,000 times 1.042 to the t. Now, by the way, going back to that little like, review piece up here, right? 3,000 is what you're starting with, the y-intercept, and this is your growth factor, 1.042. And because 1.042 is bigger than 1, thankfully, our balance is increasing. By the way, if there's an investment where this number is not bigger than 1, it's a bad investment you shouldn't put your money into it. So you would never, ever want to say that the answer to this problem is that, because that would be an exponential decay equation. That would be one that's going down over time instead of up. And, and yeah, no, 
No, no, just no. Right? Always one plus the rate. And always one minus the rate if it's going down. All right? Do I even have one of those? I'm not sure. Let's take a look. Uh, yeah, no. Yeah. Let's look a little bit at this question. A lot of people um, asked, as did um, at mud I, um, as this person did, about sort of how do I create an exponential function, or better yet, how do I just find the b value? You know, how do I find that b value if I have a tape? Right. So in this particular problem, which was number 36 from June of 2015, it says an application developer released a new app to be downloaded. The table below gives the number of downloads for the first four weeks of the after the launch app. Write an exponential equation that models these data. Okay. Notice it doesn't say anything about regression. Okay. It doesn't say, oh, you know, uh, get your best fit exponential model. Although you could actually put this into a into your stat table, L1, L2, do an exponential regression. Your R value would be one. It would be a perfect fit because this is perfect exponential sort of data. Anyway, but let, let's talk about it. Remember, what we're trying to do is we're trying to write an equation that looks like this. Now, this can be a little tricky because A, A is going to be the hard part here, not the B. A is the value that we would have sitting right here right at zero weeks so it's tricky a lot of people might say oh i'm gonna make a 120. Ugh. it's not but let's not worry about a just for a second let's worry about b you see b is what we have to multiply by each time to get the next output all right so the easy way of finding b and it really is easy all you have to do to find b with an exponential table that goes up by ones, all right? Notice those x values are just different by one unit each time. All you have to do is do one y value divided by the previous one. So you just have to do 180 divided by 120, all right? And what you find is b is 1.5, and you can check that. You can do 270 divided by 180, and you'll get 1.5. You can do 405 divided by 270, and you'll get 1.5. All right, let me make that a little bit darker. And that's my B. The question is, how do I find my A? Well, A would be going in this direction, right? I want to find that number, the missing number, when the number of weeks is zero. Well, for that, what I can do is I can actually do 120 divided by 1.5, right? I'm multiplying by 1.5 to go up this way. I would divide by 1.5 to go down that way. I believe that's 80, but I want to check it. Yep, it's 80. So what should be sitting right here is the number 80, in which case my equation is y equals 80 times 1.5 to the x. All right. I'm not going to do the rest of this problem. I kind of thought I would, but again, um, we've spent enough time, I think, on exponential, and we want to keep moving along to hit some more topics. Okay? What do we have next? Factoring and zeros. Factoring and zeros. All right. So first things first, just a zero. A zero is a value of x, typically. Let's just call it x. It's a value of x that makes an expression or a function equal to zero. That's it. It's a value of x that when you plug it into the function or into some kind of an algebraic expression, the result of all that is zero. All right? And that has something to do with factoring because if you can see the factors, typically you can see the zeros. One last thing about zeros, they are the x-intercepts on a graph. And they're the x-intercepts on a graph because... And let's say I have some parabola, right? At these two points on the graph, the function, the y value, is equal to zero. That's why they're called zeros. So let's take a look at one of those problems. 2015, number 10, at Nate, any, Nate, 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 Dasani. Sorry, there we go. Sorry about that, Nate. Um, you know, what are the zeros of this function? The idea is what we're trying to do here is we're trying to solve this equation x squared minus 13x minus 30 is equal to 0. Now, notice 
notice all the answers here are nice. Now you could completely do this by using the quadratic formula. You could do it by doing completing the square, but no offense, that'd be kind of crazy given that the B term is odd, just ugly. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to do it by factoring. Now this should be a relatively easy trinomial to factor. All right, and again, I say relatively easy because factoring is very difficult for some people. What I always want you to do when you factor is check. And again, remember sort of the foiling process, first outer, inner, last. There's no question what should go here, x and x, because x times x is x squared, right? I mean, it's got to be that way. Thankfully, there's no 2x or 4x or 5x or anything like that. It's just x. x times x is x squared. But the 30 is harder, right? Because the 30 could be 3 times 10. It could be 2 times 15. It could be 5 times 6. And to make matters worse, because we have a product that's negative, one's got to be negative and one's got to be positive. That's the deal, right? And you just have to check them. So for instance, let's say I did this. x minus 10, x plus 3, right? Well, the plain fact is x times x is x squared. Negative, times 10, negative 10 times 3 is negative 30. But this negative 10x and this positive 3x, when they combine, gives you negative 7x. And I need to get negative 13. I can't have negative 7. All right? So you make another guess. Um, and hopefully, you get to a point where you start to develop some good number sense. And in this case, it's x minus 15, x plus 2. And of course, that's correct because when we do this and this, negative 15 and positive 2 is negative 13. And that's what we need. Now, that's not the answer. That's simply how this trinomial factors. The answer we get from what's known as the zero product law, one of the probably five most important mathematical ideas, right? And that's as soon as we have something factored, we can set each factor equal to zero and solve. And we get x equals 15. And we get x equals negative 2. Right? So, right here. Okay? Now, one other thing. Right? Notice that when it's factored like this, if the leading coefficients on those x's are 1, then the zeros are kind of the opposite of what you see. It's like that sh horizontal shifting thing all over again. X minus 15 gives you a 0 of 15, and X plus 2 gives you a 0 of negative 2. Now, the reason that's important is just really quick. I'm going to pan all the way down to here. Okay. August 2016 at Victoria Mad McFadden is cool. And I'm sure that you are, Victoria. No question about it. It says, 23, based on the graph below, which expression is a possible factorization of P of X? Well, remember, zeros are the same right, as the x-intercepts. So here I have an x-intercept of 1, 2, 3, of negative 3. Here I've got one of 2, and here I've got one of 4. So you see these problems come up a fair amount. If I've got a 0 of negative 3, then one of the factors must be x plus 3, okay, to give me that negative 3. If I have a 0 of positive 2, then one of the factors has to be x minus 2. And if I have a 0 of 4, then one of those zeros has to be x, or sorry, one of the factors has to be x minus 4. And I can't get this thing to go down anymore. There it goes. Let me extend the page a little bit so that we can actually see the answers. And then you see it, right? What is it? It's um, x plus 3, x minus 2, x minus 4, choice 1. All right. It's all about x-intercepts being the zeros negative 3, positive 2, positive 4, corresponding to factors x plus 3, x minus 2, x minus 4. All right? Let me see what else we have here. Ah, right. Okay. Now, you've been doing factoring by the time you get to Algebra 1 for a few different years. So when you see just a straight-up factor this problem, 
they try to trick you up a little bit. They try to like make you kind of like think a little bit harder, right? By putting something like P to the fourth or X to the fourth in there. So both at, I don't even know how to pronounce this, and at Sam Keller too, kind of asked about factoring problems, complete factoring problems. I'm gonna actually skip down to this one. No, no offense, at whatever. Um, but at Sam Keller too, again, I think he just asked about complete factoring. So factoring this expression completely. It looks horrible because there's an x to the fourth, an x squared, oh my gosh. Except the thing is, factoring this and factoring this are more or less the same thing. And here's what I mean, right? If I factor this, it's not too bad. It's x and it's x and it's positive 7 and it's minus 1. And again, check it. x times x is x squared. 7 times negative 1 is negative 7. Then I have a positive 7x. A minus 1x is a positive 6x. That's it. So how does this one factor? Well, using structure, what we can do is we can say that must be x squared plus 7 times x squared minus 1, right? x squared times x squared is x to the fourth. Remember, add, add exponents when you multiply two things with the same base. 7 times negative 1 is negative 7. Positive 7x squared minus 1x squared is positive 6x squared. Here's the big difference. On this particular problem, when you get here, you simply stop. On this problem, you can do a little bit more. You can't do anything with this. If you have x squared plus a number, you're done. x squared plus 1, x squared plus 7, x squared plus 9, you're done. When you sum x squared with a positive number, there's nothing you can do. But this guy is the difference of perfect squares, right? x squared minus 1 squared. So where is that x squared plus 7 is done, this thing can still be broken into x plus 1 times x minus 1. And this then is the final answer. All right? Final answer. All right, let's keep going. Uh, we'll, we're going to come back to this one by Jason Morales, 99, if we have time for it. But we may not have time because we got some other stuff to do. The quadratic formula, let's, let's do the quadratic formula just once. Um, strangely enough, well maybe it wasn't that strange, not that many people asked about the quadratic formula. And maybe that's because it's just a plug and chug kind of thing, you just kind of crank through it. But let's take a look at this particular problem. So, um, at E. Hendrickson, uh, 21, asks about the quadratic formula. What are the roots to this equation? And again, you could totally do this particular problem with completing the square. You could do this problem completing the square. Let me see if I can make this thing a little bit bigger. Yeah, there we go. All right, but let's do the quadratic formula just to review it, all right? The quadratic formula says that if you have a quadratic set equal to zero, very important, it's gotta be equal to zero, then you can find the solutions, the zeros, by doing negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all divided by 2a, all right? So, let's do it. Right? Hopefully, everybody is very comfortable with a equals 1, b equals 4, c equals negative 16. Right? So it's just plug and chug. We're going to get negative 4 plus or minus the square root of 4 squared minus 4 times a times c. All right, all divided by 2 times a. Hey, red, it's been a little while. Um, so we're going to get x equals negative 4 plus or minus the square root. Do this piece on your calculator, right? Don't take any chances. I'm literally taking my calculator out. I'm putting in 4 squared minus 4 parentheses 1, negative 16 parentheses. There it is. All right. So that's 80 divided by 2. Now, be careful. Be careful. All right, um, look at all these answers, right? So, so tempting to do things like 80 divided by 2 and get 40. No, 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 no. Simplify the square root. Never let a number outside of a square root sort of interact with a number inside of a square root. They're, they're kind of like, they're locked apart from each other. But this is where I can do what's called simplifying a radical. Okay, simplifying a radical. And what that means is I'm looking for the biggest perfect square. The biggest perfect square are numbers like 4, 9, 16, 25, 36, 49, etc. The biggest one of these that goes into 80. 
So you sit there with your calculator, 80 divided by 4, 80 divided by 9, 80 divided by 16, etc. And what you find, right, is that it's 16. 80 divided by 16 is 5. So what I can now do, give myself a little bit of extra room, is I can leave that negative 4 alone. I can break up the square root of 80 as the square root of 16 times the square root of 5, all divided by 2. I now take the square root of what I can, the square root of 16 is 4, leave what I can't, that's 5, sorry about that, all divided by 2, and now what I'm going to do is I'm going to distribute that division, okay? So I'm going to have negative 4 divided by 2, plus or minus 4 divided by 2, times the square root of 5. So now, now I can have these two interact, right? It, it's like having 4x there. That's it. Think about the root 5 as being a variable. x, y, whatever. So you got the 4 divided by 2. So that's going to be negative 2 plus or minus 2 times the square root of 5. That becomes this. This becomes this. And that, just making sure, becomes that. All right, that's it, the quadratic formula. Very useful to solve quadratics that cannot be factored. If I can factor something, that's the way I'm gonna go, but many times I can't. Now, quadratic equations, all right? So, quadratic formula is something that you might use to solve a quadratic equation. But actually setting up and solving quadratic equations or setting them up can be challenging. So let's take a look at a word problem that involves a quadratic expression. August 2014, at Sarah 21105. Let's take a look. Sam and Jeremy have ages that are consecutive odd integers. Consecutive odd integers. Things like 3, 5, or 11, and 13, or 21, and 23. Those are consecutive odd integers. One after another, consecutive, and I hope you know what an odd integer is. Anyway. So Sam and Jeremy have ages that are consecutive odd integers. The product of their ages is 783. Which equation can be used to find Jeremy's age if he is the younger man? All right. Well, okay, think about it. Jeremy's the younger one. Okay. And the older one, right, like if this is Jeremy, he's three years old. That's weird. But 3, 11, 21, the older one is always two more than the younger one. A lot of people get confused about that because with odds, they want to think, oh, it's three more or one more odds. But no, all odd integers, consecutive odd integers, are actually separated by two, right? So if Jeremy's age is j, then the older one is j plus two. And then what are we told? Well, we're told that the product of their ages is 783. So what that means is if I have j, and I multiply it by j plus 2, I have to get 783. And by the way, if that's one of the equations sitting here, then you grab it, you circle it, you bubble it in, or whatever, and you move on. It's not one of them. Notice that none of these have j times something. So we just simply need to distribute. And of course, j times j is j squared. 2 times j is, well, 2 times j. And that's equal to 783. So j squared plus 2j is 783. And there's our winner. That's pretty easy. Not too bad. Now, this one, June of 2014, by at Lauren Harris, I guess, Harris, sorry, Lauren, at Lauren, right, is actually what's known as a literal equation. An equation, we talked about this a little bit before, an equation where there's multiple letters in it. In this case, a V, uh, an R, an H, there's even a pi, which is technically kind of a letter and a number, and it's, it's all over the place. Anyway, this problem asks us, right, it says the volume of a formula for a cone is this. The radius of R may be expressed as what? In other words, we're trying to solve for R. Now, why is that showing up? in this particular slide? Well, because r is being squared, right? And what do I want to do? I want to get rid of the one-third, I want to get rid of the pi, I want to get rid of the h, and I want to get rid of the fact that r is being squared. So it's really simple. Mostly what's being done to r is multiplication, 
right? We're multiplying r by pi, by one third, by h, and we're squaring it. The squaring is the first thing that happens, so it's going to be the last thing that I undo. So let's start to undo some other things. Let's get rid of the multiplication by one third by multiplying both sides by three. Okay? Let's get rid of the fact that we've multiplied by pi by dividing by pi. And let's get rid of the fact that we've multiplied by h by dividing by h. All right? And what we're sitting at this point is 3v divided by pi h is equal to r squared. The last thing that we need to do is just simply take the square root of both sides. Now normally, taking the square root of both sides would introduce a plus minus on this side, but because the radius of a cone cannot be negative, there is no negative. That's not even one of the choices, quite frankly, but I thought I'd mention it, and of course, that ends up being like this. All right. Simply look at what's been done to the r and the order in which it's been done. Multiply by one third, multiply by pi, multiply by h, and square. Undo it in the opposite order. Okay. Um, no offense, Kylie, but I'm going to move on just a little bit. All right. Because there were a lot of people, including at test makes the mess or text test makes themes. I'm not sure which, um, but e either way. Um, there were a lot of people that wanted me to do some kind of a quadratic problem that involved a word problem and dimensions of rectangles and things like that. This is a relatively easy one, but let's go through it and we'll come back to a harder one if we have time. All right, January 2016, number 36. A contractor has 48 meters of fencing that he's going to use as the perimeter of a rectangular garden. Immediately, I'm like, all right, I got a rectangle. Okay. The length of one side of the garden is given by x. Great. And the area of the garden is 108 square meters. Determine algebraically the dimensions of the garden in terms of meters. All right. So what do we really have? Well, we've got x, and we've got x, OK? And we've got this 48 meters of fencing, right? And that's got to go all the way around here. Now, what I don't know is I, I don't know what to put here, right? I could use another variable, all right? Maybe even I'll do that for a second. Let me, uh, let me call it L for length, all right? This is almost becoming what's called a systems problem at this point, okay? But what, what do I really have? Well, what I know is I know that two of those x's plus two of those lengths that's got to be equal to 48 meters, okay? It just has to be, all right? Because though that's the deal with length. x plus x plus l plus l has to be equal to 48, okay? The other thing that I know is that when I multiply those two together, x times l, I have to get the area, 108 square meters, all right? That's what i got to get. But I've got these two equations with two unknowns, x and l, x and l. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to actually solve this system of equations by doing substitution. I'm going to substitute this equation into that. Now what that requires is me to solve this equation for either x or l. All right. Keeping in mind that like I'm more comfortable with x, I think I'll solve this one for l and plug it in here. All right. So solving it for l is not too bad. I'm going to subtract the 2x from both sides. I'm going to get 2L is equal to negative 2X plus 48. And now I'll divide both sides by 2, and I'll get L equals negative X plus 24. Remember, you have to distribute. Negative 2 divided by 2 is negative 1. 48 divided by 2 is 24. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to substitute that into here. So I'm going to have X times negative x plus 24 is equal to 108. All right. So far, so good. Let me pan down a little bit so we have a little more room. Distribute. Don't start using things like the 108 product law. There is no such thing. You can't set this equal to 108 and this equal to 108. But I'm going to get negative x squared plus 24x equals 108. All right. 
Every technique that we use to solve quadratic equations involves having them set equal to zero. Whether you're going to use factoring, the zero product law, the quadratic formula, no matter which ones of those you're going to use, you need the quadratic set equal to zero. So I might as well subtract that 108 from both sides so that I have it equal to zero. Now, you could start to work with this right now. You could factor, you quadratic formula, whatever you want, complete the square if you really want. But that negative attached to the x squared can be problematic for a lot of students. All right? But there's an easy way, of course, to get rid of that. You can multiply both sides of this equation by negative 1. All right? And it works really nicely because number 1, it's going to turn this into x squared minus 24x plus 108. And this, it's not going to do anything to. It's just going to be equal to, whoops, I lost my x there. Sorry about that. It's just going to leave that equal to zero. My mic cord is stuck on my shoe. That's kind of funny. OK, it's off. You never, you never realize what's going to go wrong in a situation like this. Anyway, so we, we, we've got something like that. And now the issue becomes, how do you want to solve it? Do you want to try to solve it by factoring? Do you want to try to solve it using the quadratic formula? That's kind of up to you. I think what I'm going to do, though, is I'm going to leave it here because really the hard part of this problem shouldn't be solving this. We can, we can use any of the methods, completing the square, the quadratic formula, factoring works. It all works, all right? If you're very comfortable with the plug and chug quadratic formula, even with the large numbers like the 24 and the 108, use it. Just be careful, right? At the end of the day, it's more about sort of setting up this problem and kind of modeling through it or muddling through it, depending. Quarter of. Quarter of. Oh my god, it's a quarter till five. This is how it works. All right, systems of equations. Well, we just sort of did a system of equations. Um, hmm, let's keep going. Well, sorry, Julia and others. Um, I'm going to try to get to as many as possible. Let's talk about inequalities a little bit, okay? Inequalities are anything that have a greater than or a less than sign in them, anything like that. So you've got two types of inequalities. Well, there's a lot of types of inequalities, but the kind that you're dealing with, you basically have two types. You have inequalities that have only a single variable in them, typically x, but they could be calling it anything. And then inequalities that involve both x and y, both x and y. So let's take a look at number 27. I love it. I'm going to just move this down some. Here's a situation, that's lovely, where you've got an inequality, at Arisa 703 asks about this, um, you've got an inequality with only a single variable. It kind of looks like there's more than one, but there isn't. Let's take a look. It says, given 2x plus ax minus 7 is greater than negative 12, determine the largest integer, integer, and the largest integer value of a when x is negative 1. This is the regions that say I'm trying to get a little gimmicky. I'll be honest with you, trying to get a little gimmicky. All right, quite frankly, I'm going to take that negative 1, I'm plugging it in for x, okay? And then let's see where we're sitting at that point. Now, many times they don't do something like that, but I wanted to throw one of these out there, especially since it was asked about. So I'm going to get negative 2 minus a minus 7. It's greater than negative 12. It's kind of ugly, but just working on one side of the inequality has nothing to do with inequality, just sort of properties of numbers. I can combine the negative 2 and the negative 7, and I'll get negative a minus 9 is greater than negative 12. All right, I'm going to just keep solving this inequality the way that I would solve an equation. I'm going to add 9 to both sides. All right, I'm going to get negative a is greater than negative 3. All right, and this is the one place where solving a linear inequality is different from solving a linear equation. I'm going to divide both sides by negative 1. And when you divide an inequality by a negative, it flip-flops the inequality. That's also true as if, if you multiply both sides of an inequality by a negative. It'll flip-flop the inequality. But it's mostly division. So what we get is we get a is less than 3. a is less than 3. Now, I want you to think about integers, whole numbers that are less than 3. 
2, 1, 0, negative 1, negative 2, etc. Determine the largest integer that makes this true. Well, that's going to be a equals 2. Not a equals 3, because of course 3 is not less than 3. But 2 is. 2 is less than 3. All right, so remember, when dividing both sides of an inequality by a negative, flip that inequality sign. Let's take a look at January 2015, number 34, at Ms. Alexi Reichel. Reichel. Okay, so here we're talking about inequalities that involve two variables, x and y. So first, let's take a look at this. Letter A says, write the inequality represented by this graph. All right, well, here's the deal. Forget about the shading. Right? Just think about this line. What is that line? Let's just, let's just talk about y equals mx plus b, right? Where m is the slope and b is the y-intercept. Well, the y-intercept down here is 1, 2, 3, negative 3. All right, and what's the slope? Well, we can figure out the slope of this line graphically by just looking at nice points on the line, that's, um, let's see, 1 over and 2 up, so the slope is 2. So that line is y equals 2x minus 3, right? That's not the inequality. The inequality is y is greater than or equal to 2x minus 3. So two issues there. Why is it greater than? It's greater than because we've shaded above this line. Look. In any slanted line, there's a portion that's below it, and there's a portion that's above it. And we've shaded above the line, right? That's why it's greater than. Why is there also the equal sign? Because that line is drawn in solid, it's not drawn in dashed. Had it been drawn dashed, then we would have only had greater than. Speaking of, letter B, on the same set of axes, graph this inequality. I'm going to write it up here so we can see it a little bit better x plus 2y is less than 4. There's a little red in, involved. Okay, now, in order to graph an inequality, what you're going to do is you're going to rearrange it so that it looks like y equals mx plus b. No problem. Subtract an x from both sides. Now, I'm not switching the inequality. I didn't, I didn't multiply or divide by a negative. I simply subtracted x from both sides, and the 0 minus x is negative x. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to divide by 2 on both sides. Again, no switching the inequality there, okay, because I divided by a positive. Tricky, that division has to distribute. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get, oops, not equals, or not equals. Y is less than negative 1 half. Where did that negative 1 half come from? Well, there's really a negative 1 sitting in front of the x. So negative 1 divided by 2 is negative 1 half x. And then, of course, 4 divided by 2 is 2. So how do we graph that? Well, pretend that you're just graphing the line. So here we are with our y-intercept of 2. Now we have to have a slope of negative 1 half, meaning that we're going to go to the right 2 and down 1, to the right 2, down 1, etc. Right? So this is how I would be graphing this line anyway. Now, because it's less than not less than or equal to. I would draw that in dash. Hopefully I would have a ruler. I don't have one right now, but I'd have that. And now because it's less than, I'm going to shade below it. Just think about this as part of a roof. You know, if you were hiding out about, you know, underneath that roof, it's down here. that inequality. The last thing, right, letter C, let me see if I can extend this, uh, the two inequalities graphed on the set form a system. Oscar thinks that the point 2, 1 is in the solution set of this system of inequalities. Determine and state whether you agree with Oscar, explain your reasoning. Well, let's take a look. Where is 2, 1? 2, 1 is right here. It's this point. Oscar thinks it's in the solution set. Well, the solution set is everywhere where you have the double kind of hashing, where you have the double shading going on. Is Oscar correct? Well, the plain fact is no. All right? And the reason that the answer is no 
is because that point lies on this dashed line. Okay, if this line had been solid, whoops, sorry about that. If that line had been, so there's no way I'm gonna get this to, to be back then. Oh, good enough. If that line had been solid, then it would have been fine. Okay, then that point would have been in the solution set. But because it lies on that dashed line, the dashed line is not in the solution set. Okay, it's not. It's where this thing would be equal to negative one half x plus two, not where it's less than. So you could literally say, no, it lies on a dashed line. Or you could say no, because it doesn't lie where the shading overlaps or intersects. That would be OK as well. But I like the dashed line piece. Oh, we're getting there. Statistics. OK. Lots of questions about statistics. June 2014, Megan um, Abdu, at Megan Abdu, um, asked about correlation coefficients. Okay, so first, a little background on correlation coefficients, also known as R values. R values tell you the predicted value, kind of how good a particular curve, mostly lines, sometimes exponentials, but how well it fits the data. And all R values, all R values for linear, go between 1 and negative 1, all right? Now you might think, well then that means negative 1 is terrible and positive 1 is great, but that's not true. Actually, what's horrible is 0. So a positive 1 is what's called a perfect positive correlation, literally meaning that if you looked at what's called the scatter plot, you'd see data that fell in a perfectly straight line with a positive slope. On the other hand, an R of negative 1 is also a perfect correlation, correlation, it just happens to be what's called a negative correlation, so it's got a negative slope. The line is going downhill. Sorry about that, I totally missed. All right. So when I look at this scatter plot, they, they say, what is the correlation coefficient of the linear fit of the data below to the nearest hundredth? Well, you know, you might think, oh, I should put all this data into my calculator, into my list one, my list two, run the linear regression, find the R value, etc. And you could do that. There'd be nothing wrong with it. Except, here's the thing, right? It's not positive 1, nor is it positive 0.93, because the line of best fit for this data has a negative slope. The R value is going to be negative in this problem. So it's either negative 0.93 or negative 1. Except, if the R value was negative 1, then it should, all this data should lie in a perfectly straight line with a negative slope. But it doesn't. It doesn't. Right? Right here. Now, I do think, even though we're running short on time, that, that we should take just a minute to pop out of here. Okay, and the reason that we should take a minute to pop out of here is that before the Regents exam, your math teachers are going to have to clear the memory on your calculator. And when they clear the memory on your calculator, that sets your calculator back to a default mode. And on most of the Texas Instruments calculators, on most of them, the default mode, for some inexplicable reason, is to have the R value turned off. Did we, did, did we stop going live? We're still good? At some point, the live stream is going to cut out on us again because we've exceeded our hour limit, apparently. No worries, no worries. Anyway, so just as a really quick aside, at least on the Texas Instruments 83, 84, things like that, you need to do what's called turning diagnostics on. So when your teachers reset the memory on your calculator, the R value is going to be turned off. And if for some reason you come up to a question where you have to know the R value, actually calculate it, the last problem we didn't really need to calculate it, then you have to have it turned on. There's a lot of different ways of doing this, but for me, maybe the easiest way is the mode button. All right? Because what happens is way down at the bottom on this mode, it has stat diagnostics. And right now, my stat diagnostics are turned off. So if I even did that problem, the one that we were just doing, and I wanted that R value, I have to turn that on. If I don't turn that on, the R value doesn't come up. I, I don't know why. Major design flaw, major design flaw for Texas Instruments. Anyway, let's go back really quick. Uh, box yes. whiskers. It's four minutes. Four okay. minutes, okay. Uh, more of these, more R value. Let's talk a little bit about residuals. There's plenty of people that ask about residuals. Um, okay, 
So first, what's a residual? Well, look, when you've got a data set, some data set, and you fit it with a line of best fit, all right, then there are errors involved. The residuals are the errors. They are literally, if you take this y value and you subtract the y value that's actually on the line, that's the residual. If you took this y value and you subtracted the y value on the line, it would be that residual, okay? So the residuals are the errors, okay? So that they're, they're the errors between the model and the data set. That's all they are, okay? But here's the key. When you look at residual graphs, there's two things. The most important thing is that you don't want there to be a pattern. You don't want this. This is kind of a pattern. Notice it almost looks like a parabola. You want those residuals to be scattered. You want them to be scattered up and down, kind of in this random way. So this particular problem says, the residual plots of two different sets of bivariate data are graphed below. Explain using evidence from graph A and graph B, which graph indicates the model for the data is a good fit. This is the better one for two reasons. Reason number one, the residuals are scattered. Reason number two, the residuals are much smaller than they are over here. Now, mostly what they expect you to know is that the residuals should be scattered. They should be kind of chaotically um, scattered about the x-axis as opposed to this pattern, all right? But if you had two graphs where they were both kind of chaotically scattered, and one of them had residuals that were much bigger than the other one, I mean, look, we have residuals here that are going as high as like four, whereas here the highest that they could possibly be is around 0.5. This, this model has very small errors in it. This one, much larger errors. Residuals are errors. That's what they are. Um, how are we doing? Two minutes. Two minutes. Okay. Until, until five o'clock. Until we th oh, until five. It's probably going to cut out at what, like five oh five, or I, I, I just I don't remember when the last one. Yeah, yeah. We don't know when the live stream is just going to go dead. Okay. <laughs> um, so I'm just going to keep talking until it goes dead. Um, you know, and, and take a look at the last last one. Piecewise functions. Oh, yeesh. yeah. Um, piecewise functions. Functions that are defined by two formulas, two formulas for the function. All right, so just a little, little, little talk about piecewise fun functions and did we, did we cut? It can, no, it gives you a, it, we have two minutes left. It's telling you now. Oh, fascinating. Okay, yeah. so it actually gives us- Do you want to go back to comments or no? Uh, we'll go back to comments, but why don't we wait until it like kills us and then I'll finish this, like we'll, like, we'll let it like, like like finish oh, the stream, gotcha. then we'll, we'll restart it. Um, okay. I'll finish talking about this, we'll take some comments, and we'll wrap up, I okay. guess. Okay, anyway, so let, let's talk a little bit about piecewise functions, right? No, don't worry about this. this. This is the equation of a line, it's got a y-intercept of one, it's got a slope of one half. The point is, this particular function says, okay, look, when the x values are less than or equal to negative one, you should be plotting this line. When the x values are greater than negative one, you should be plotting this parabola, okay? It's a parabola because it's got an x squared in it. So if I'm looking to plot this, which is the thing that's kind of challenging, what I always tell students to do is plot this, don't worry about that at all, just plot it. So in other words, I'd go and I'd say, all right, it's got a y-intercept of one, it's got a slope of two, all right, something like this, you could even, you could even draw it in dashed. Why could you draw it in dashed? Well, it's kind of like that inequality thing. If it's dashed, it's not really there. It's not. Now, in order to graph this parabola, what you would do is you could put it into your calculator to create a table of values, things like that. What I'm going to do is I'm going to I'm going to plot it um, because I, I I know sort of how um, kind of the best I can, just freehanding it. Ten seconds. Ten seconds! <laughs> Ten seconds until we cut out. All right. Three, two, one. <laughs> Boy, especially with the delay, you know. I, it's, yeah. But we can get right back in here. Yeah. My video has ended. At least we had a sense that it was ending this time. <laughs> this is good to know. This is a learning experience. <laughs> so it gives you a two-minute countdown. Now we know. Yeah. Okay, we're nice. live again. Oh, we're live again. All right.
Going back. I have to literally use one of my children's phones. Oh, the comments are on. Myself. The comments are on by default, so should I turn uh, them off for the um, moment? Yeah, turn them off just for a second. No offense, we're going to turn them on in just a bit, and I can't even see that, unfortunately, yet. My, my son's phone is having a problem. Let's, let's go back to this problem really quick, though. So I've got my parabola sort of graphed and dashed. I've got my line graphed and dashed. Now let's, like, fill them in, okay? And what do I mean by this? The line should apply when x is less than or equal to negative 1. That's right here, right? So I'm going to put a nice solid dot there, and there's that, right? The parabola, on the other hand, should apply when x is greater than negative 1, so that's moving to the right. That means what I should have here is actually an open circle, all right, and then this parabola kind of going like this. Sorry about the, the poor drawing. It should look a little bit like that. All right, and that's that piecewise function. Just to finish the problem off, if I was doing this one, right, where I've got a y-intercept of 1 and a slope of 1 half, Right, not a piecewise function, it would just look something like this. Now, golden rule, I would want to label these things. That is a horrible, horrible line. But I'd want to, you know, I'd give it a shot. I'd want to label these things with their equations, and, and seriously, I can just do this. And just go, oh, that's g of x, and uh, this is f of x, just like that. Make sure if you graph two or more things, you you put identifiers on them. It's simple. Um, the last part of this problem, which is kind of an important one, says how many values of x satisfy this equation, f of x equals g of x? If you see that, it's all about the intersection points. It's all about how many times the graphs intersect. And this is a horribly drawn graph, but they actually only intersect once. Now, we don't care really where they intersect. Because here it's just asking how many, and they intersect just once. One, and the explanation, because they intersect once. I'll put a little explanation point. All right, I'm going to try to get the comments back on mine, um, if I can. Come on. There we go. All right. We got it back. It's rotated. Oh, can I talk more about flip that? Hey, flipping the inequality sign. Um, the problem is if we open it up to more questions, we could, we could literally be here until about 8 o'clock at night, which, you know, sounds horrible to me, but uh, yeah, I got a producer. He's probably going <laughs> to go somewhere. Um, so thank you, Chalky Chalk King. I, I would say I love you too, but I, I don't know you. Um, anyway, so, so I, I know that this was brief. You know, it was two hours, um, debatable. I hope that you got something out of it. Uh, hopefully, we're going to take the video um, that we actually made from this, uh, convert it to an MP4, get it up onto YouTube tomorrow. Um, sure, Henry, I'll do it. Welcome to the Wilder Zone, where time has no meaning. That's, that's from Mr. Henry Bubbles, who has one of the better screen names. Um, don't get me wrong, there's lots and lots of great screen names out there. Um, you know, one of my absolute favorites is the screen name, Seriously, No One Likes Your Whatever. Because then, when that person likes my post, it says, Seriously, No One Likes Your Post. Uh, I also loved one of the comments that I got, which was, I dislike math, can you help me with that? Um, don't know if I actually did help with that, but, but we gave it a shot. Um, yeah, I, I hope certain things were helpful. Hi, Olivia. Um, I guess I nailed it. Yeah, um, can you please do residuals? Well, we, we did just do residuals a little bit. Look, one thing I can say, I've never yet seen them force you to actually produce the residual graph, okay? It's always been interpreting the residual graph in terms of the multiple choice. Um, there was one free response problem where they literally gave you the residuals and then they were like, plot these things. And it's like, okay. So you're just doing a scatter plot with the residuals. That's pretty much it. Um, line of best fit is all about putting the data into the two lists, going into your stack command and then saying to it, all right, like do a linear regression, getting out the A and the B, right? If you have to, then you get the R value and you interpret that. What is math? 
that's deep. Um, no, I, I, I can't keep doing the problems. Sorry, you guys, um, as, as much as I'd like to. You got Wednesday and Thursday coming up, right? I do have Wednesday and Thursday coming up. Keeping in mind, though, Wednesday will be the Common Core Algebra 2 portion. So we're going to do review then. Um, geometry is going to be on Thursday. Both of those are from 6 to 8 p.m. Um, again, I'd, I'd love to keep, keep going with this, but we, we got to sign off. I want to thank you all for joining me. Um, I do want to say, for those of you that joined, for those of you that provided comments and all of that, you probably did something that has never done, been done before. You know, I kind of doubt, I don't know for certain, that there's ever been a review this large, this live, on a social media platform. So that's kind of cool. I um, thought 1,050 was the top number. I okay. Saw. So it looked like at some point we had somewhere over 1,000 people watching, tuning in. Kind of makes sense. We have about 4,000 followers. Um, and hopefully we had more than a thousand people actually watch the thing, but you know, we had to cut the live stream a few different times. Um, all right. So thank you so much for joining us. Good luck on Tuesday. Remember, get a good night's sleep on Monday night. Remember that you've got three hours for the exam. Remember you've got your calculator, which can do a ton of stuff that we didn't even get into in this. My apologies. And you'll be fine. All right. You're going to be good on this exam. Just take your time. All right, everybody, take care, and remember, keep thinking and keep solving problems.